I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Greetings and salutations in the name of our Lord. Welcome to another fabuloso day in the Lord's neighborhood. And welcome to another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Page, where you get to watch me think with my mouth open. Today's chapter is going to be really, really stinking interesting. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Not, I, I just did a cursory read of it and got a couple background notes, but I'm really going to be interested to to hear what I have to say about this. <laughs> this is gonna. This is a cool chapter. Um, so let's get started without any further ado. I'm just going to read through it uh, and make a couple comments, and then I'm going to take a, take a few moments and th truly think with my mouth open about what this is saying about God, what this is saying about me. Mm. So let's get started. Here we are, chapter 22 of Numbers. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. All right, we well can see Jericho on the map there. It's a little red dot just above the Dead Sea. They're getting ready to stage their initial assault into the Promised Land. We're coming to that part of the story now. Now Balak, Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. Previous chapter, Israel had... Uh, whipped up on the Amorites pretty badly. And Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, this horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at the time, I got to make an adjustment here. There we are. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, the whore, this horde is going to lick up everything around us just as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to summon, summon Balaam, son of Beor, who is at Pethor near the Euphrates River in his native land. Now, apparently... Balaam was a very well-known diviner. You might call him a warlock. Um, he was versed in all kinds of magic and divination, and he wasn't a fake. Now, there are people who, who claim to have special powers and talk to the dead and divination, stuff like that. There are people like that who are just out to uh, fool people and, and to... Um, cheat people, but there are legitimate practices, practicers of divination. And apparently this man was one of those. So Balak, the king of Moab, summoned Balaam, who lived down around the Euphrates River. Since Balak believed there was no military way to withstand the Israelites, he sought to oppose them through pagan divination sending for a diviner with an international reputation. Now, there's actually one of Balaam's non-biblical prophecies preserved in literature outside of the Bible. Uh, and he lived, uh, see, where was it? Today? Sending for a diviner with an international reputation. Uh, oh yeah, and, this, and it was preserved in Aramaic, inscription from Deir Allah. Uh, east of the Jordan River, just north of the Jabbok River, dating from the 8th or 7th century BC. So 
we have, but we know of Balaam outside of the biblical account. Balak said, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination. And when they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will report back to you with the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite official stayed with him. Now, on the, on the surface, of, of, surface of this, it looks like this prophet, this diviner, I should say, Balaam, has a relationship with Yahweh. I don't think he does. Well, in fact, I'm pretty sure he doesn't. I know he doesn't because of what scripture says elsewhere. And we got a bunch of references down there. Um, but he was the real deal. He was used to dealing with supernatural beings. And to him, Yahweh would be just another one of those. So the language here, and in verse 18, the Lord my God, he calls him the Lord my God, has led some to believe that Balaam was a believer in Yahweh, the God of Israel. Based on the subsequent narrative, however, it seems best to take Balaam's words as claiming to be the spokesman of any God. Balaam is universally condemned in scripture for moral, ethical, and religious faults. So uh, he's not remembered favorably in scripture, so you can't call him a man of God. But he had ability to speak to supernatural beings. And to him, Yahweh would just be another one of those. God came to Balaam and asked, who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. People has come out of Egypt, covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. So God's having a conversation with this false prophet. God is appearing and speaking to Balaam, who is a diviner, who is a warlock, a witch. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's officials, go back to your own country, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. Hmm. So the Moabite officials turned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Balak sent other officials, more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, this is what Balak, son of Zippor, says. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered them, even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord, my God. Now, spend the night here so I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. All right, he, he uses the term, the Lord, my God. But then he says, he just says, I can't go beyond what the Lord, my God says. But spend the night here and let's find out what else the Lord will say. We'll see if there's a loophole. This isn't the act of a godly man. This isn't the act, actions of a God-fearer. Um... He makes his living as a diviner, as a witch, a warlock, whatever you want to call it. And to him, this is just another encounter with the supernatural. That night, God came to Balaam, probably in a dream, and said, since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. All right, so God's going to let him go. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the Moabite officials. But God was very angry when he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it, so he beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn 
either to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You've made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you've always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, Balaam said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a sword drawn, so he bowed low and fell face down. Now, normally, when the Lord appears or an angel of the Lord appears, the first words out of the mouth are, fear not, because, well, that's the kind of reaction that angelic visitations bring with them, right? Fear not. But he doesn't tell Balaam to fear not. He's tell, In a way, he's, this is God saying, you know, you have reason to be afraid. The, Lord, the angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I've come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. Now, God is starting to reveal himself as maybe something that Balaam has not dealt with up to this point. Balaam has had supernatural communications with, of course, Satan and his minions, obviously. But this is the first time he's dealt with the God of the universe, Yahweh. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now. But I would have spared it. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I've sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if you're displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So this, this little intervention with the angel of the Lord and, and Balaam really is just to really drive home the point of who's in charge. God is. Yes, he's speaking with a diviner, a witch, a warlock. He's speaking with someone who's used to speaking with, inter, with uh, supernatural entities. But Balaam is beginning to realize that this supernatural entity is different than the others he's dealt with. When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went, he went out to meet him at the Moabite town on the Arnon border at the edge of his territory. And Balak said to Balaam, did I not send you an urgent summons? Why didn't you come to me? Am I really not able to reward you? Well, I've come to you now, Balaam said but I can't say whatever I please. I must speak only what God puts in my mouth. Now, Balak wouldn't know that this is Yahweh he's talking about. God's, every culture had their all their gods. And this was a powerful man, Balaam. And when Balaam said, God's going to put words in his mouth, he just accepted at face value. This is a very, very interesting interaction. Then Balaam went with Balak to carry out the Hussot. Balak sacrificed cattle and sheep and gave some to Balaam and the officials who were with him. And the next morning, Balak took Balaam up to Bamoth Baal. And from there, he could see the outskirts of the Israelite camp. All right. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So here we are. Balak has finally got Balaam on board. Balaam is a diviner. Balaam is someone who deals with the supernatural and he's the real deal. And he's not a faker. He's not a charlatan. And God appears to him and God speaks to him. He does not have the fear of the Lord. He's used to dealing with supernatural beings. And it wasn't until the angel of the Lord revealed himself to Balaam that he fell down in fear before him. But again, I want to remind you, the angel didn't say fear not because this isn't a good thing. And man, Balaam is playing with fire. So he has worked it so that he can actually come and perhaps mess with Israel on behalf of Balak the king. He is pushing, hoping to find a way to curse Israel 
because this king is going to reward him very handsomely. This is what he does for a living. This region is about to be introduced to the Lord of the universe, Yahweh, Jehovah, the one who sees all these names. Oh, God is, is getting ready to come into Canaan, and they're about to see that the God of Israel is not to be trifled with. Balaam is trying to trifle with him. Mm. So what do I take out of this? Well, first of all, there are legitimate practitioners of divination in the world. There's a lot of fakes. There's a lot of charlatans. But there are some that are absolutely the real deal and deal with the supernatural. Um, I have... I was, uh, when I first got married, my wife and I lived in an apartment building in San Leandro, California. And as we got to know our neighbors around us, there was a woman who lived up on the third floor. We lived on the second floor. There was a woman up on the third floor and we went and had coffee with her one day or tea. And, and, just, and she had all these really exotic things. She'd been a world traveler and she had traveled all around the world. And she had all these idols Buddhas and, and different things, different scary looking things all around that she was a collector of, she said. And, um, but I got a very, I got a very uh, strange sense when I was around here that it, this wasn't right. And I, I couldn't, I, I didn't know what to make of it all. And she told me while we were having a tea that one day, Oh, it might have been another day. It's been so many years ago. But she told me, she says, you're very odd. I can't read you. She says, I usually am able to, to read a lot of people. And she would do fortune telling, that kind of thing. She says, I'm, you, I can read people, but you, I can't. It's like you're, you're a blank slate. I can't read you. And then, what, what, this is what was really strange. The next three nights after she and I had that conversation, I had a dream where she would appear to me in my dream chanting spells or something of that nature, and I would call upon the name of the Lord. And and just I would just speak the name of Jesus, and then I'd wake up out of the dream. Second night, same thing. This time there'd be like there was a dark cloud with red eyes that came and hovered over me, and I was in terror, and I squeaked out the name of Jesus, and I woke up. The third night, I dreamed I was in the stairwell of our apartment building, and this woman was coming up the stairs, and she was staring at me, and she was chanting spells or something. I don't, I can't remember what exactly what it was, but I remember falling to my knees in the stairwell and calling upon the Holy Spirit of God to flood the stairwell with His presence, something to that nature. And she, in my dream, ran screaming out of the stairwell and I woke up in a cold sweat I might add she was a real deal and people like that tend to think of our God as just another one of many not realizing he is the king of kings lord of lords and when they attempt to trifle with him nothing good comes of it On other occasions, I have been face to face with uh, with demoniacs, people who have been possessed by demons, who, and in the name of Jesus, that supernatural entity was chased away. Now, it doesn't happen every day. It's not like I find demons hide behind every bush. But God exposed me to enough of it to realize, to make me realize that there is a very real and present danger. There are real diviners. There are real witches, real warlocks, if you want to call them that. Uh, and they are the real deal. They commune with the supernatural, with, sp with the spiritual, with the spirit world. But our God is above all. And our God is controlling this scenario here with Balaam. Balaam thinks he's in charge. He's wheeling and dealing. He's found a way to go to Balak and, and he's gonna and we're gonna see in the next chapter when we talk about it how he's really gonna try hard to curse Israel. But he's gonna find out 
for the first time in his life, perhaps, that he is not in charge, that this is not just another God, small g. This is indeed someone much more powerful and that he is ill-equipped to deal with. So what do I take out of it for me personally? Well, just a realization that there are supernatural forces at work that are real. This isn't just a, a, an intellectual uh, faith that we have. This isn't just, well, I found the right book to read and the right rules to, to follow kind of religion that we have. Paul says that there's a prince of the power of the air. And in Ephesians, he talks about wrestling against uh, these spiritual forces. And he talks about having the spiritual armor of God to combat it. Uh, there are very real spiritual entities out there that want our destruction. And sometimes they do it through blunt force trauma, as I would call it, or some, you know, or sometimes they use deceit, like the enemy try, is trying to use deceit here to curse Israel. And we'll find out what happens in the next chapter. But our God is powerful. Our God is the God who sees. He sees the truth in all things. And we do not have to live in fear of these people who are legitimate practicers of divination, who are legitimate witches and warlocks. We don't have to live in fear. Our God is stronger than that. Our God is powerful. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. And Balaam is about to find that out. All right, with that, folks, I'm done. I'm out of here. Have yourself a great day. God's blessings. Bye-bye. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither should my thoughts be your thoughts. You need to think for yourself.